Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Cove. I'm Jennifer Laplante, the Executive Director of DeepSense, and I'd like to welcome you for our very first discussion on Mind the Gap Technologies of Business Optimization for our panel series. Today, I'm joined by three wonderful guests who are going to talk about their work and experience with additive manufacturing. 3D printing technologies have evolved well beyond the little knickknacks and bobbleheads we might have seen. And my guests today are going to share some of their stories and insights about how this technology can be integrated into their business to optimize production costs, production, sorry, reduce costs, increase efficiency and precision, and help businesses to grow and compete in natural and global markets. I'm going to introduce my guests today um, in a minute, but first we're going to cover off a little couple of housekeeping things. There's over 100 people that are online with us today, and we encourage you to participate in this conversation by sending some comments and some questions via chat. I have a couple of great team members at Cove here that are working in the background to help curate your comments and questions in real time. And we're gonna interject them into the conversation as best we can. And since this is a conversation today, there aren't any presentations. There's just some really good questions to get the discussion started and keep us focused. We will be recording this session and it will be on YouTube with the link available later this week if you'd like to revisit, or we strongly encourage you share the Mind the Gap event so we're going to meet our panelists and I apologize because I'm reading. So let's go through as I look down, Ben. So Ben Garvey is a 20 year veteran of consulting and engineering world in the Maritimes. He has an extensive involvement in a myriad of industries and technical and technical challenges. So he has experience with cutting edge FE, FE analysis and additive manufacturing where formative tools in the early parts of his career. So he bought the first commercially available 3D printer and bureau printing to Halifax in 2005. He set this up in his basement, which is very exciting, and he was able to optimize models to support corrective surgery planning at the IWK Children's Hospital. I just skipped a total line there, I'm really sorry. Doo -doo 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 -doo. Okay, sorry about that, Ben, I sincerely apologize. I didn't realize I'm so bad at reading out loud at live. Okay, Ben set this up in his basement and he was able to optimize 3D models to hundreds of clients over the next years, including revolutionary spine and skeletal deformity deformation models to support corrective surgery planning at the IWK hospital. Since then, several other 3D printers and their supporting equipment have formed a key part of the solution development in this company, along with a host of other manufacturing technology, including CNC man machining, interjection mold, injection molding, forging and casting, and CNC sheet metal forming. After graduating from the mechanical engineering program at Tons in 1996, Ben worked with many local and international companies as a staff engineer and consultant. Since 2003, he has been growing and developing the team at Ingenuity here in Halifax. It's a 35 person firm now that offers multidisciplinary product development, complex numerical analysis, robotics and automation, electronic design, and a host of other technical services and products to a wide range of clients and industries. So welcome Ben. Our next guest, that's joining us today on the panel is Frank DeFalco. He's based in Ottawa and has extensive experience in both public and private sectors. He's currently the director of member relations with the Next Gen Manufacturing Canada, NGEM. Frank established Canada's premier additive manufacturing network, Canada Makes. In his time leading Canada Makes, he delivered the metal additive demonstration program and introduced additive metal manufacturing capabilities to over 200 Canadian companies. In this capacity, Frank developed an unrivaled knowledge of Canada's additive manufacturing ecosystem. Previously with Harrison Corporation, Frank was part of the first manufacturing team in North America to successfully introduce just-in-time lean manufacturing to the production of printed circuit boards. And last but not least is Mark, Mark Kirby. After graduating from MIT in Aero Astro Engineering, Mark joined Rolls-Royce working on air breathing rocket engines before he moved to his father's machine workshop, Jet Blades. Mark worked his way from a CAD programmer to managing director, making parts for Formula One and Rolls-Royce jet engines, which is fascinating and I wish we could talk about that. In 2007, Mark immigrated to the Maritimes in Canada with his family and he provided hands-on coaching for companies introducing advanced manufacturing as well as teaching engineering at the University of New Brunswick. Mark joined Renshaw in 2013 as the head of their new Canadian manu additive manufacturing business and to start up their first North American Solution Center. In 2020, Mark moved to the University of Waterloo to lead the industry training for additive manufacturing. So with those big long intros, we're gonna start first with Frank. So Frank, since not everybody here is joining us today has a full idea of everything we're talking about, can you share a little bit of an idea of additive manufacturing and perhaps to those who aren't really full of uh, share 
aren't really sure of its full utility. So can you provide us with a bit of the Coles notes about the technology and where it might fit into the ocean sector? Sure. Uh, I want to thank uh, Coe for, for this opportunity and uh, Welcome the other panelists. I look forward to this uh, engaging session. Well, added manufacturing, uh, some people often refer to it as 3D printing. Uh, if for anybody's wondering why it's called additive manufacturing, it's unlike other manufacturing processes. You're adding material versus subtracting material. Um, there's a lot of materials available and there's a seven main uh, uh, additive uh, processes. I'll just name them per, uh, quickly, but we won't go into them. But there's binder jetting, there's a directed energy deposition, uh, material, material extrusion, a material jetting, powder bed fusion, which is a one uh, that we mostly did under that uh, industrial demonstration program I did, sheet lamentation, and here's a tough word I always have a hard time with that, photopolarization, <laughs> and uh, that's sort of some of the, you know, those are the seven main technologies. In regards to, um, you know, additive, additive is changing, is changing a, a lot of different sectors. Often the more common sectors you'll see in use for the technologies, aerospace and medical, because it's often important to, to, to look at, you know, low production runs. So if you're, you know, if you're making millions of something, it's likely that you're not going to use additive, although there could be solutions in helping in the, in the production. In, uh, in the ocean uh, sector, you know, it's really interesting is, you know, in Canada, I've done projects out, out west and uh, the, you know, there's a real harsh environment. And, you know, when we're talking about the oil sands, and that's similar with ocean. So you, additive does offer a lot of, uh, you know, capability and a lot of um, interesting potential applications. A couple that I've come across in, in, uh, in, in uh, with companies is uh, one of them was a deep water uh, photographic coming out of a, a, a Newfoundland and Labrador. A couple of years ago, they, they were looking at, you know, creating a pressure, uh, you know, a pressure uh, container for their cameras as they would do inspections on the oil rigs. And that was a, that's a kind of an interesting application because you're not going to need a lot of those and, and you need a lot of customs. And it is a quick capability. You can create something that's that fits that camera just right and, and can send it down. One of the other areas that I've seen, and uh, this was done uh, back a couple of years ago in the Netherlands, was uh, building propell propellers uh, for, uh, for for ships. Uh, I've also talked to a company in Canada that does uh, build propellers, and they're really looking to try and, and, and uh, incorporate. And that would be more the directed, you know, putting basically a, a laser welder onto a robotic arm and, and doing that. And afterwards, you you do more traditional themes. Often, additive is is a combination of different technologies to to, to you know to, to really be useful. And uh, the, those are really a couple of areas that I've seen that are really really uh, interesting. And but you know one of the area areas you think of, I've been seeing you know stories about you know having a three D printer on a ship. You know, it gives you a quick capability to to do you know certain parts. Uh, you know that you you might not have an inventory. So again, there's a, a lot of capability additive offers. These are some of the areas that I think are interesting. I don't know if any of the other panelists have any more to add on, on that particular beginning. Mark, I'm just going to chime in with. Uh, Rolls Royce was one of my customers before, and they the, the guy used to tell me the world's most expensive part is the one you haven't got, and I think that ties in with Frank's, you know, the ability to produce on demand, and even though it it may not seem like such a clever idea, um, something is often better than nothing, and you can't carry every single spare part. So, the idea of being able to produce something to get you out of a tight spot. Um, I, I think certainly resonates in these remote environments. Fantastic. I think those are those are two great pieces in terms of what it is and how it can be solved and the most expensive part. That's a great illustration. Moving to Ben. So Ben, you're the ideal quintessential startup entrepreneur in the tech space where in the ocean space where you started in your basement, you've moved into a big growing company. But let's go back to when you first started with 3D printing. How did you know in the early days that you were onto something? Um, it was a it was really a shot in the dark. It was a it was a, a gamble really. Um, but it quickly proved to be um, quite welcome and and in in my experience what happened was I started showing up to companies that that um, it, mostly in the region here with a, a briefcase of models of samples of, of things that I could do on this 3D printer and and you know in comparison to the 
printers that are available today. It was it was quite primitive. It was one of the first um, plaster powder printers, um, and so the models that were produced on it were were essentially these very fragile little um, excavations that you had to pull out of the powder, and it was a, it was a painstaking process, but it. It actually produced beautiful models, um, and if you could extract them from the powder without breaking them, and then were able to coat them with various glues and epoxies and, and impregnate them with uh, some some strength, and then they made um, they made quite functional models in the end. When I when I was able to take these models to companies um, in the region who were developing their own products, doing design iterations. Um, all of the designers immediately realized, look, you know, when I say I can produce this and you can put it in your device and it's good for form and fit and function testing um, and you can have it in two hours versus, uh, you know, two hours to do the design, an hour to do a drawing, you send it over to a machine shop, um, you, you'll wait a few days for a quote and it's going to be two weeks to machine it out of aluminum, plastic, metal, whatever, whatever you're working with um, for traditional manufacturing methods. And then you get it back uh, two weeks later and you realize, oh, shoot, the whole pattern is wrong or it doesn't fit or damn, it, it doesn't work. Um, so the, the, the 3D printing in, in my use in those days around 2005, 2006 was just rapid iteration um, of design uh, feedback to a design team. You know, you're developing a product, you can you can develop it rapidly, print it, try it, make changes all in you know one continuous cycle. Uh, people realized that quickly, um, and it, it became uh, almost full-time work for me for a while, running a, a printer, printing the things for other people, and then uh, then my whole house was full of plaster dust from running it. It was, it was a bit of a, a nightmare, too, but uh, in, in the early days, it, it was really quite revolutionary. Uh, you know, now we've we've moved to other technologies, as, as Frank outlined, and uh, it's still a, a major part of our design cycle. You know, I, I've got... A dozen things on my desk here that are 3d printed from you know parking meter housings to you know stainless steel subsea mooring connectors to uh, uh little little um you know mounts and housings and snaps and clips and all kinds of things it just it is so quick to produce a physical prototype that you can drop into your assembly test it out break it change it and, and evolve the design rapidly. It's, it's quite revolutionary that way. I feel like there's going to be some questions that come from our audience more specifically, not just about what you've just shown, but then some of the challenges or how you go about doing it. But I'm going to move to Mark for our next question. So Mark, you, you know, with your background, you've been involved in several different industry projects with additive manufacturing. Um, can you describe some of the projects that um, are both amenable to this type of technology? Sure, I, I, I'm just going to go back to Ben's story, though, because he kind of undersold himself a little bit because not only was this technology revolutionary, but really uh, he was he he bet his entire, I, I think, probably future. I think, Ben, you spent seventy five thousand dollars on your first printer as yeah. a small business, you know, that that's um so i think that kind of speaks to the kind of person ben is i've only met him recently but uh you know i, I think certainly um you, you know having a resource like that in the maritimes is fantastic so um projects i've been involved with uh i didn't have any show and tell in my hands but everything from uh obviously being a rocket scientist i love making rockets so uh, we've made things like a rocket powered drone that weighs less than a kilogram and uh, goes Mach 0.8 for three minutes. Uh, and this kind of speaks to one of the strengths of additive where maybe it's about developing a new solution. Um, uh, you know, we tend to focus quite a lot on product. A lot of us are suppliers to other people. It's maybe not our product, um, but um, there's still a strong entrepreneurial um, culture, I think, within Canada, and probably developing new solutions is something that Canada really ought to be good at. And you couple that kind of thinking with the technology, and I think you can get some quite powerful results. I think maybe we've got a video that shows um, something that was done across Canada, maybe illustrates that point. Great, we're going to play that now.
My name is Ryan Church and I'm the founder and CEO of Biome Renewables. Uh, Biome is a biologically inspired engineering and design startup based here in Toronto. We're focused on the power cone technology, primarily in wind and tidal energy. Uh, the power cone technology is our flagship technology that we're bringing to market. Uh, it's an aerodynamic and hydrodynamic retrofit technology for wind and tidal turbines. When we first started to think about how we wanted to prototype our tidal power cone technology, we reached out to the Nova Scotia Community College, which had a Renishaw additive manufacturing 3D metal printer. And in working with them, we realized very quickly that we could make a tidal turbine very cost effectively and very quickly uh, and get it into the ocean. My name is Neil Lominen and I'm the project coordinator for Applied Research at the Nova Scotia Community College. NSCC Applied Research works with industry to find solutions to their real-world challenges. When companies need products manufactured, the team relies on my expertise and the suite of manufacturing technologies found in the Design Centre. When Neil first approached us for technical support, we knew right away this would be a great project to work with Biome Renewables. NSCC was the first college in Canada to have a metal printer and it was great to see them producing parts like this even on an older machine. Biome Renewables approached us to build two versions of an underwater turbine prototype. Their goal is to apply their innovative wind technology to tidal. We used the Renishaw 3D metal printer to meet a tight timeline to get the prototypes built in time to be shipped to Ireland for testing. When the project grew from not just one turbine but two turbines, in order to meet the project timeline, we decided to split the work between us with NSCC producing some of the components and Renishaw Solution Centre producing some of the components here. And this let Neil focus on final machining and assembly of the parts ready for testing in Ireland. 3D printing uh, for us, it helps us get prototypes in the water so we can get data faster. The power cone geometry is also a very unique and complex curved geometry, which actually lends itself very well to 3D printing. When we look at the financial implication of using 3D metal printing, uh, we realized that there was about an 80% cost savings alone in going this route, just through time, materials, uh, and getting it to market. If we were to go the old-fashioned way, which would be maybe making a mold and casting our product, um, we, would have, we would not have been in the water by now, we would still be making it. Um, so 3D metal printing really gives you that advantage, uh, both time and cost. The power cone's deployment in a tidal environment is the first known uh, use of 3D metal printing in the world. So we're very happy to be uh, pioneers in this aspect. This complex international project involving Biome Renewables, NSCC, Queen's University and Renishaw Canada really shows the power of collaboration. So that was a great video. So um, a couple of things. One is we realize if somebody wants to submit a question or comment, if you're not signed in on YouTube and you're watching this live, you can send an email to info at coveocean.com. Um, and that will be great to, to see any of your questions that you come, especially out of this video or the conversation. Um, so Mark, I really liked that video because it showed how um, complex a uh, project can be and very collaborative as well in terms of creating this fabrication of a turbine. Um, can you share a little bit with us on how the technology can support national and international collaboration within the ocean sector? Sure, I'll, I'll do my best. And I think probably coming back to uh, actually what you saw in the video um, were two different products and solutions. One was the smaller rotor which was actually an improvement to an existing tidal turbine and biome make these for wind turbines. I, I liken them a bit to like seeing a winglet on an airplane. The airplanes have wings, but you can actually make them better. And sometimes, uh, you know, by bolting something on. So, so one of the applications there was a, a new solution to somebody else's product. Um, but biome went one step further as well and they, rethought the problem of power generation and and one of the things with generating power underwater is the size of the foundation that you need um, and so there's very curved blades that you saw where biome were attempting to take the next step and i think this speaks to to what ben was talking about earlier about how companies can either collaborate with somebody else maybe to explore the market and their ideas but they can also use the technology maybe to take them all the way 
into having their own um, product. But again, you can't do everything by yourself. And I think one of the things that you know we're getting better at in Canada is is collaborating. I think our, our culture our culture predisposes us to collaborating. I am a Canadian, despite my accent. Um, but but it is sometimes easier easier said than done. Um, but again, coming back. Additive lets you do things quickly, so you can. Uh, the buzzword is fail fast, uh, and and at, and at low cost. You know, nobody actually wants to fail. Ben talked about, you, know, you can plug your part in and, and watch it fail. And I was thinking, well, of course it won't fail because you ran your FEE analysis. But it's always the things that you didn't think about that tend to tend to throw you off track, which is why we still need to do testing. So additive really uh, increases that pace. And as Ryan uh, Church was saying, you know, let them do it. Uh, very much faster. There was some hyperbole in there. I uh, apologize for that. And of course, if anybody wants to buy a machine, I can't sell you one anymore. But uh, um, I know a few people who could. I just wanted to add to that, you know, one of the things I, I found when doing the metal demonstration program and with all those companies is how important, I want to reemphasize how important collaboration is because it is a difficult technology to adapt. You know, Ben will tell you right there, he, he was probably so alone in that world at that time. There's a lot more resources nowadays that, you know, that are available. You know, uh, there's service companies, uh, in Canada, they're excellent service providers that can really help a company, you know, go through those uh, growing pains and, and adopting the technology, particularly in metal additive. Plastic is far more established, but the metal additive is something that's still emerging and it, it's it's really, really important to, to, to understand it needs to be a collaborative effort to bring in a lot of different skills to make a project successful. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. It's There's a you know, it, there's a real skill to designing for additive manufacturing, believe it or not. It doesn't, you know, it's a, it's a interesting challenge to build things with the correct, um, you know, overhangs for support. And uh, you, have to, you have to really understand the actual technology you're using to be able to extract a model successfully um, and remove supports and remove uh, pieces that, that otherwise might get in the way. And that, that's certainly been a challenge for us over the years, even, even moving into some of the new technologies. I think, you know, following on these comments, one of the questions that I'm really curious about is, is how a smaller company might even start down this path. So first, what's the easiest way for them to learn a little bit more about it? Well, um, that's interesting you say that, uh, you know, I, I was doing Canada makes uh, for, for a few years before I came over to NGEN and it was, uh, the goal of Canada Makes is really to help companies take those steps. You know, Industry 4.0 is a catchphrase, and Engine is a is a powerful tool, but it is just a tool. Sometimes you have to remember that that it's not going to completely take over somebody's manufacturing or production. Uh, you, you know, it, we are looking to right now. I'm working on a what I'm calling a technology adoption portal, which is going to be a tool for particularly designed for SMEs looking to, to try the technology. That we can, you know, and give them information that uh, we've learned and that we can share. You know, it's going to be online. It's going to be a free service. We're not quite there. Uh, I'm actually working with Mark Kirby on that, but we're really excited about that. That we're going to be offering, you know, these tools that can really answer a lot of the, you know questions that companies need to get there and uh, this will be available you know I would think uh, March April time frame there is some information uh, uh, we recently published a white paper on you know the uh, the landscape the ecosystem of Canada's added manufacturing uh, um, ecosystem and if anybody's interested we can always maybe uh, make it available you can reach out to us at NGEN but uh, we are working uh, to, to create these tools we've got a group uh, we've brought together of experts from across Canada uh, which we we, uh, we are consulting with and uh, this will be a tool that will be very useful yeah yeah I would I would add to that by saying that there is uh, there's so much information out there now uh, you know, and, and the, the proliferation of the kind of lower cost um, filament fiber um, machines, FDM technology, there, there's one, in, uh, you know, what is it, one in every 50 households or something now? It's, it's amazing. They're everywhere. Um, and and uh, messing with one of those will teach you the principles, uh, no matter what um, technology you're going to be looking at in the future. It teaches you the basic principles, and and it's easy to do, uh, low cost. Most libraries have them now. 
almost every high school and, and junior high and uh, community centers have them. You know, and, and a couple of hours of, of YouTube watching will, will educate you in ways that certainly wasn't available when I started. Um, and it, it really is quite powerful. But getting your hands on it uh, and actually doing it, making the mistakes, that's the way to learn it. Um, and then talking to people who are, who are in the industry. You know, consult with uh, the service providers, consult with the salespeople. I wouldn't just trust the first three reviews you read. Um, just get into it, really. There's, there's, no, there's no real harm in trying to get into it. 100% with, with Ben there. You know, when you put your first machine in, Ben, it was $75,000, and you, you had to, to bet everything on that. Now it's it, it's not even seven hundred and fifty dollars. Yeah. So there's really you know I would say if you're in if you make anything if you're in manufacturing if you design anything if you have a CAD system, there's really uh, computer aided design. There's there's really there's there's not an excuse not to have actually three D printed something. Uh, within your company, within your organization. It'd be great. I don't know whether the people running this in, at Cove can poll the audience and find out how many people have actually printed something. That would be great to know out of the 100 or so people online, how many people have actually printed something. Um, yeah. it, it's, it's, a great way to, it's a great way to learn. It, it's a, it is a language of the future, um, it, or it's a, it's a tool just like CAD, just like CNC. It's not, as Frank was saying, the only tool. Um, but it is a language that um, Canadian manufacturers and designers need to be fluent in. Um, so if you're not fluent, then, um, as Ben says, you know, get started. And, and, and as, as you ramp up with the technologies, you know, it can vary from $750 to multiple millions of dollars. Um, but, there are, there are, you know, that's why there are partners and collaborators to go to. So, uh, yeah, reach out. Yeah. I am really curious now. So yeah, if uh, someone comment and let us know if you have 3D printed. And this is my little side tangent. My dad 3D prints and I honestly probably had never even considered the concept until he started 3D printing his little army tanks for his various reenactments and it's upgraded now to very to to newer and newer. And yeah. you're right, you can learn quite a bit online if you invest the time and have patience, I think is is what he says, but he's older too, so maybe that's why. But let's say I was a company or any of our other companies listening today and they're trying to decide to go down this road. How do they decide in terms of complexity and price threshold? Like, you know, you, you said there are various versions and it's all about trying to decide how much to invest. How do they know what makes where they should kind of invest their time and effort? And what's that threshold or cutoff for people to know when they should step into this? Frank, you want to jump on that one? Yeah, I've, uh, I've had companies uh, ask that question, particularly when it comes to metal additive, uh, which is a huge investment, especially if you're talking about powder bed or directed uh, uh, directed uh, energy deposition. Uh, this is not cheap. Uh, a powder bed uh, machine will cost you anywhere from three quarters of a million dollars to a million dollars and plus. And that's just for the machine itself. And uh, so when you talk to a company, I've had companies, you know, approach me and say, we're looking to get into the uh, metal additive manufacturing. And I say, have you checked the cost? And they said, yes. And, you know, often uh, Mark will be familiar with this, you know, and uh, how much have you spent in the past on your, what's the most expensive machine you have on the floor? And they might say $100,000 or something or $75,000. And they go, okay, well, you're going to spend a million dollars and that's not even considering the, uh, you know, the room and the safety. If you if you're using titanium, it's a volatile material, so you have to have a special storage facilities. These price tags start going up and up, and then if you you know if you don't even have an expert on site, which they're difficult to find, people have done this, so you're going to have a wrapping up period of, of months before it, it becomes. Uh, you know, you, you've got a competent staff, then, uh, so I'd ask them, if you have a good business case for it, you know, Mark mentioned earlier, yeah, if you're a, a manufacturer, you can always find applications, you know, for, for uh, you know, inexpensive 3D printers to make jigs and these sorts of things. That's, that's certainly always available and it's certainly something worth exploring. But if you're talking about doing production and high-end, it's, it's something you really have to be, uh, 
careful in your investment because you're talking well over a million dollars and you may you know it's a tough market to get into if especially the these companies have uh, a lot of work to do to, to to characterize materials to to ensure that they you know they they're creating good parts and once they're there they, they're ready to go so you better have a good business case before you make those investments that's what i advise have a good business case but but it can be uh, really valuable, really uh, rewarding too for, for a company. And and just to sort of, you know, um, put a slightly more positive spin, maybe that you know, the equipment you have when we're talking, say, ocean ocean equipment, um, heavy energy, uh, it, it may be massive, uh, um, both in size and the investment you already have in it. So the ability, for example, to repair it, uh, which additive gives you. Um, is tremendously useful. It's not necessarily trivial to do, but the ability to repair equipment um, as well as to prototype new products like Frank was describing, the underwater camera system. So what we're seeing with additive is the addressable market um, is gradually increasing. Um, that uh, It's not necessarily going to re replace everything, but it's becoming more competitive in different in different areas, and I think it's being being aware and you know starting in the prototyping is 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 a great way. Uh, but maybe you have bigger ambitions, and again, that's where maybe you would partner with somebody who's already who's already got the equipment, is expert in using it, and you can kind of really figure out does it work. Often the people often come with um, can I print this, and really the question is always you know should you print it because the answer is always in a way yes i could print it but it's having that clear understanding and uh, you know i come from a subtractive world of milling and turning let's say you're not normally confused whether i'm going to mill this component or i'm going to turn it or i'm going to do both um because the geometry the whole part is shouting at you you know turn me turn me the trouble with additive can be um you know print me, print me, we can print anything. We're gradually going to see more and more designs that clearly were intended to be printed. And, you know, but that is going to take some time, but that's what the SMEs will see, just like they would have seen a drawing come through and they'll realize, oh, I need EDM, I need a special process for this. Um, we're going to see that, but, they, but SMEs who are making parts for other people won't be seeing too many parts right now that absolutely shout additive, unless you're working on a cutting edge with a company like Ingenuity, where you know it would be part of the everyday language. I'm sure with Ben. Yeah, and, and to build on that a little bit, one of the one of the areas where we're seeing you know a, a strong drive towards additive um, in whatever material it doesn't really uh, matter is where you're using um, topology optimization software, where you're you're starting with. Uh, uh, you know, a, a 3D CAD model, or maybe not even starting with a model, you're starting with a need to connect a device to take a certain load or to handle an airflow or to handle a, a certain water flow. Um, and you want it to be perfectly optimized, um, as in you only have exactly the right amount of material in exactly the right place and the streamlines are flowing in the right way. Um, and, and there are now, you know, the, the AI that's being built into some of these pieces of software are, are incredible and they can optimize based on any number of given parameters to generate um, to generate a, a 3D model or shell or profile that is actually, um, you know, not producible by any other manufacturing method. You can have these perfectly organic looking, strangely enough, if it's structural, they, also, they often look like bones. Uh, where you have um, shells on the outside, um, hollow cores, or lightly filled uh, lattice structures inside where you've got only the material you need, where you need it, and nowhere else. Um, so, I mean, you'll, you'll see this in cutting edge applications, as you well know, um, guys, both of you in, you know, in rockets and, and in uh, F1 cars, in offshore racing, um, in all kinds of uh, high load, high end um, applications where weight um, is absolutely critical, but we're also seeing it in places where um, where fluid flow and energy energy conservation is required, and where you want to get the optimal transfer of, of energy across a medium. So there are there are new tools that are coming out on the design design side that drive um, only three D printing as a manufacturing path. 
which is really fascinating to us. The optimization piece is what, you know, the, these organic shapes that get generated by AI are, are quite phenomenal. They're, they're, they're pretty cool. So um, we're going to move along to some other questions that we're getting from the audience right now. Um, so one of them we're going to put on the screen, um, but there's a few different ones around um, training and the different types of training, how long things take. Um, so, for example, um, if you were to purchase some kind of technology, what kind of training is needed and available for people to get up to speed so they can use that? And how long would it take? And I know there's going to be a, a it depends answer, but yeah, everything from this to this yeah. <laughs> that's what it comes down to. I, mean, I, mean, I, I, I can certainly training is a is a passion of mine. Um, so. Yeah, if you buy yourself a, uh, a $750 printer, um, then, you know, uh, in an evening, uh, I would expect you should be having your first print come out and you'll be learning a lot and you'll be, and if it fails, you'll be looking up why did it fail and you'll be learning, you'll be learning that way. So um, it could be an evening. Um, if it was some of the more uh, exotic technologies, uh, laser powder bed, uh, Typically, you know, I'm, I'm a huge fan of um, evaluating by by learning first. So uh, typically a training course would be um, somewhere between two days and a week um, so that you get familiar with the workflow. Uh, then then I'm a fan of sort of mentoring in terms of how do you, it's one thing to learn how to do the basics, whether it's programming a robot um, or a metal printer and then the devil is in the detail with your specific applications so that's again where having a partner you can work with beyond the initial so you'd be competent uh within a week typically to run the equipment whether um whether you can really as it were make music with it um i don't know and i'm not sure i would necessarily um advocate that that route, um, you know, uh, if you re you really need to figure out whether you can make music with it, um, uh, and you know that doesn't necessarily mean uh, that you need to buy the technology, but you certainly need to partner with somebody. You need to do a project together, um, and 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 often it's doing. Unfortunately, often it, I say unfortunately, the cool stuff is three D printing. Yeah, and, and as engineers, we love that that challenge, but. Sometimes it is more, you know, what do the numbers look like? Um, uh, how? My first question is always, how are you solving the problem right now? And I love it. If somebody comes to me and says, I can't, so I don't know how to solve the problem, then I'm sure Ben will say the same. Then we know we're onto a good, you're onto a good thing because you can help. When when people are, people are feeling pain, you can help. If they come to you and say, well, it's just a bit expensive the way I do it right now. Well, you know, uh, you know, uh, wake up and smell the coffee. Um, this isn't necessarily a way of just yeah. taking cost out of a product. Absolutely agree. Yeah. Um, and there was a question from Laura asking about some of the resources, but hopefully, Laura, let us know if that one didn't answer um, answer your questions. There, um, did you, Frank? Did you have any other suggestions or recommendations? Yeah, the resources, uh, there's there's the program that I did run. I think it's still going to be available. Uh, I don't run it anymore. With It was with the CME, the demonstration program. I know I was talking. We are looking to it. That's always a good way to try uh, a, a new technology. Sometimes, you know, I, I like to consider it like a kick at the time kick at the tires, you know, look at it and feel, uh, that's one way you get a tactile, get something to hold for a part. Sometimes it's not the best part, but it, it's really key to, to understand that you know, often it's not so complex, the, 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 the technology, it's the designing of the, uh, of the part. Uh, you know, Ben was mentioning in the lattices and all that, you know, you really want to, you know, figure out you need a solution. So, where are some of the resources? Canada Makes has some resources. If you go under that, there's free resources. I would go. There's a an excellent tool there for a process design guide and a, 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 a metal design guide. These are two tools we uh, we put up on Canada Makes. Which I would invite you if you're if you're interested in metal 3D printing. Those are tools. We are uh, reproducing those. As I said, the engine. I wish it were ready. I wish I could direct people there. Not quite there. Um, there is no, uh, we're, we are working 
with groups to try and get some more training available, industrial training. There are courses, a various amount of courses available across the country. Um, there's no accredited certification uh, uh, that I'm aware of. Mark might be able to answer that better. I know there's working. I know uh, University of Waterloo is, is you know, one of the leaders in, in uh, training for additive and uh, yeah, we're, that's one of the really key projects we're doing over at NGEN is we want to make the tools available to answer the questions for that person or that company that looking to, to get into the technology. It's really what that's going to be about. It, you know, we're almost going to be more of an, a, an assessment tool. And then, you know, you come in, do a check, you check off something. This is where I am in, in, in my understanding. We, we want to put you on the right journey. We don't want to waste your time with stuff you don't. If, you, if you've done that initial part, why send you there? Or do you want to get to that next level? Then, uh, of course, it's always going to come down to you're going to have to get to, to a machine yourself. There's only so much that could be done online. Eventually, you have to go and, and do hands-on applications of it. And there'll be, uh, there's various resources around the country that, that are doing that now. Did you have any others to add, Mark or Ben? Sure, I'll I'll, I'll come to the sort of choosing your partner, and you know there there are there are different there are different flavors. Um, there from uh, you know, so I would uh, you could go to a machine manufacturer who you know again you have to always see it from the other person's point of view. They they want to sell you a machine. Um, they, you know, and you know, some are better able to support you than others. Some have a strong presence in Canada, some don't. Um, so, uh, you you can go to the machine manufacturer. You can go to a service bureau who has this equipment, who will print your part. Um, there are there are some online. There are, you know, Canada has um, a, has several quite strong strong bureaus. Uh, so you can get an online quote, and again, that's always interesting. So places like Zometry, Proto Labs, they're based in the U.S. Um, they do quite a bit of business into Canada. Um, you can get an online quote. Um, so again, that will give you a flavor for how much your part is likely to cost. It doesn't teach you very much, though. It just says, hey, it's going to cost you 500 bucks, and it doesn't really explain why. Um, you could go uh, so um, you can go you can partner with a university um, uh, who typically are uh, looking to solve some of the fundamental uh, problems so that either a university or a community college looking to work on real projects with real problems the time scales often maybe not as dynamic you know, I'll be honest. Um, so, uh, or, you know, I go to, you know, if you've got a company like Ingenuity on your doorstep, then, you know, it's always easier to work with somebody who's local. You know, I mean, that's just a, that's just a truism. So I would, I would start your search for who's around you, those different flavors. Again, the NGEN portal will help connect you with the different flavors in your area. And then, you know, just sort of, yeah, maybe you want to try all of them and kind of make an assessment but you, you just be uh, aware that everybody kind of has a somewhat different agenda here in terms of helping you um at, but ultimately you have to help yourself so yeah. great we have a, yeah, we're, uh, oh, we're very just to add one thing uh, we, we're very very important at, uh, at engine that it's agnostic information that we're not going to be favoring you know and you know to, not to be negative or some, some, sometimes the best answer we've given companies about getting into 3d printing is when maybe it's not for you at this time and, and you know at this and high level to, to build on that a little more i mean it, most public libraries have 3d printers uh, municipalities are putting on courses quite frequently uh, you know during covid maybe not but um there are lots of community groups online. Any major city or even minor city is going to have somebody who sells 3D printers and printer material now. You know, I know here in Halifax, there's a shop in uh, two or three shops now. There's one in Sackville in particular that sells um, both printers and materials. Uh, and and you'd be surprised. There are, there are 3D printers everywhere. So if you're just getting into it, spend a couple hours on the web, uh, learn what you can, go to the library, uh, go to community center, go to university. They all offer uh, intro sessions, hackathons, weekend stuff. I know, you know, at Dow they have the Idea Hub, the Idea Lab. There's there's lots of stuff going on with 3D printers everywhere. I think there's probably four or five in the Cove building, as well. And Jen, you, 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 I just want to build on on this that some some you said, oh, my dad 
does 3D printing now I think about it. And some of the other companies I've spoken with um, say, oh yeah, you know, I've got a 3D printer at home, but y you know, you really have to bring it into the work environment, not necessarily your printer, but but sometimes there's still this sort of divide. It's almost like, well, that, yeah, that's my hobby, but I never really took it seriously. Um, and you won't take it seriously till you try, you know, putting it through its paces to print a little bit more than, you know, just um, uh, tanks for battle reenactments, for which it's fantastic. Um, but, but you know, so you, you have to kind of go through a live fire exercise. So I'd encourage people again, just like Ben saying, you know, um, whether it's your local library or whatever, but bring it, tr give it, give it a, a work focus um, because then you'll figure out what it's good for and what it's not, what it's not good for. Um, I just, just wanted to add really quickly is, is I've heard this often. Some people, uh, they get that $700, you know, $50 machine and then they think, well, that's crap. It's not doing what I want it to do. Be careful, you know, there's a big difference between $750 machine and an industrial scale machine, which you will go up to, as we said, three quarters of our hundreds of thousands of dollars. The, the capabilities, you know, often you're not even doing the right part. You know, as we mentioned, there's a lot of those seven different main technologies. Sometimes maybe you should have chosen one or the other. So don't, you know, judge all of 3D printing by an inexpensive, uh, yeah. you know, desktop machine. There is a there's definitely a sweet spot in there for for startups. Um, you know, you can you can buy a pretty sweet machine for you know four or five grand now. That'll do. You know, it, it is still a, just a filament extruded machine, but you can get some pretty nice surface finishes uh, and pretty nice prototyping out of a you know sub five thousand dollar machine. Uh, and what just one more point I wanted to make on that um, for all the students who might be watching, we're seeing. Um, in, in we, we take four or five co-ops uh, every term and in the resumes of people who are applying and people who are coming to work with us uh, we're seeing a lot of people with, that have home 3d printers who know what they're talking about who printed gobs of stuff and and really are on top of it and it i have to say is a hell of a sales uh, tool if you're if you're out trying to work in the industry uh, as a student get familiar with 3D printing uh, because it will force you to become familiar with uh, CAD modeling and the whole process. Uh, it's, a, it's a hell of a, of a step up. Yeah, you'll be, you'll be speaking that language and building your resume, your portfolio of work. You know, there's this uh, Titans of CNC are trying it now where, yeah. you know, may, maybe students really differentiate themselves on, on, on what have they done? I've worked in first robotics. I've done this, you know, what can you, what can you, what can you show me? Um, so uh, yeah, I, I, absolutely. I think people who differentiate themselves by, um, being able to solve these problems and inevitably, you know, the problems get bigger as you, uh, uh, as you start, you know, you move from screen to, to the real world, then you learn a whole bunch of other things as well. So I think, you know, what you're saying is fantastic. I'm going to pull together a couple of questions and synthesize them because there's a few that are along a similar line. But one of the things in the comments that is fantastic is there are students that are talking about buying inexpensive printers, learning CAD programming in the room at Dow, for example. So there's, Echoing exactly what you're all saying that there's students who are learning and that's fantastic to see. There are some questions though they're asking specifically around the actual types of materials you're using. So there's questions around corrosion and metal. So if you are dealing with different solutions in the marine environment, um, what happens with whatever you've 3D printed? And then there's that question right there. There's another one also talking about plastics and how strong it would be. And so um, looking at this one in terms of the metal parts and corrosion, can someone speak to uh, the challenge with dealing with, is it any different? Is corrosion treatment different than it would be through any other type of manufacturing process? Do you want to take it, Ben, or I'll take it? You lead off, Mark, and I'll uh, follow up afterwards with our experience. Yeah, I can add something about a project I helped fund afterwards too. So, you know, the, the, the simple answer is, you know, it's metal um, and, you know, uh, you're going you, you, to, to a first order, you're going to get what you expect. So you'll need to use the right metal. Um, you may need to use the right treatments. And then if I've printed something that's very exotic, there may be some other significant issues around surface finish. Can I, is, is the fatigue life the same? And this is why 
to qualify some parts in aerospace um, historically may have taken you know several years sure. and maybe maybe a million dollars but this is where standards are really starting to change again the landscape where we have a standard for how it should be printed and then the, you will get the performance that you're expecting yeah i would, I would add to that to say um you know understanding the fundamental method of of uh, construction is is key there so i mean it's essentially a welded part when you're doing um when you're when you're working with powdered metals and welding them together with lasers it's you're essentially ending up with a, a welded uh, assembly a very nicely welded assembly i mean there's a there's an example of of a of a nicely finished welded stainless steel with you know see that beautiful finish on the inside there that's post machined which gets us the corrosion resistance we need but it's it is that's a welded 15.5 stainless metal centered part um that i would have no problem putting in the ocean because of the of the surface finish on the on the product in the end but you know if you if you go with some of the lower quality earlier metal additive approaches you'll get a quite a porous surface in some cases and that can lead to some bits of crevice corrosion etc um, but it, it comes down to surface finish as it would with a normally welded part and just to build on what the universities are doing, one of the, the streams of High AM, which is a network of seven Canadian universities, including Dalhousie, working on uh, expanding the universe of materials that are available for 3D printing, because it's fine to say, oh, I can have any shape I want, but then say, oh, oh you can only print it in these three materials, then that, that's not, we, we need, we want to have our cake and eat it too. So, um, you know, the Canadian ecosystem is working hard on how do we, how do we expand the universe of materials? How do we get cheaper materials? It's, again, it's no good using ten times less material if the material is ten times more expensive in the first place. So, you know, we, we, these are some of the real challenges that that academia is working hard in partnership with industry on, and Canada has a tremendously rich um, ecosystem in terms of raw materials. We have lots of trees, we have lots of powder, but you know, like, you know, we don't want to just sell trees. Uh, you know, it's like Ikea, we want to sell furniture and the same in metal printing. We want to add more value and NGEN is very much about um, promoting that within industry. You know, how do we look to add more value? I, this project I, I funded was just, kind of answers a lot of there was this company approached me that made a pipeline inspection gauges uh, they used to call them pigs it's an alberta company that uh, and they were looking to they had designed these parts that they thought additive would be really good for but they weren't sure how well it would hold up in a in a harsh environment like that was so they used titanium and they weren't sure about the quality would it hold up in this high pressure environment and and so they tested it uh they they tried it they did some you know field testing and this is one of the success stories they're using it as a production you know it was a it was just hit it hit it on all the what they needed you know titanium doesn't have very it's good for corrosion uh and that was a real winner of a case. So, you, you know, the, if you're looking at certain applications, you know, it really, the metal is from all, it's a little bit better than cast from, from a lot of the testing that we've done with, with, uh, with the, so if you're, if you're familiar with a cast, you know, so think of a metal AM is, is, is along those lines, even a little bit better. And we have another question that we tossed up there as well in terms of plastics being strong enough. So, um, someone's planning on buying that 3D printer and using it for an underwater pressure housing system. So, thoughts on 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 this application? <laughs> <laughs> it's, we've done it many times. Uh, <laughs> you know, for for mounting things inside a pressure case, absolutely, it's it's a fantastic use uh, for 3D printing. We do it all the time. Um, I have a, don't have any examples of actually mounting inside a pressure case, but one of the things we use our printer for one of our printers for most often is building, you know, PCB mounts, battery mounts, housing mounts, um, things that, that go inside the case. Uh, and we usually print them in ABS or nylon. Um, those are very, very strong materials, even in, you know, in a layered 3D printed structure, not quite as strong as an injection molded where you get the, the molecular uh, bond all the way through and, and the hot plastic, but plenty strong enough for prototyping. And even for some limited production work, um, I would hesitate to use it as the actual watertight housing uh, itself 
for a bunch of reasons. The, the chief one being, why would you do that when you can go buy plastic pipe, uh, which is pressure rated and, and cheap as dirt uh, from Canadian Tire or any other place and make a, a cheap um, ABS or PVC um, test uh, cylindrical chassis or, or housing for a pressure case. Um, if you're doing prototyping, use the cheap materials that are designed to withstand pressure that are rated. Um, that's the that's the fast way. Uh, once you get to a production product, then you probably want to be looking at um, again working with extruded pipe, but um, you know doing some post machining to get the proper seals, proper end caps, that kind of stuff. And, so, and let uh, me but, let me just the, the value add in your answer there, Ben. Huge, yeah. If you're a student or you you know you'd not gone into this yeah. if you go anywhere else they'll just sure i'll print it for you you know um as opposed to you know look how much value was in that answer there and you know that that's what i meant about choosing the flavor of your partner because you won't get that from a bureau you won't get that from zometry you won't get that from a machine they will just they will try and solve the question that you ask can i print the chassis not say why don't you use a piece of pipe um so you know great great answer great example of of you know why you know you really should, should should reach out and use the ecosystem around you thanks ben i think that um that was even just that alone that little summary was perfect mark because we're essentially coming to our time um there there are a few more questions out there that i i want to touch on but i think then we're going to end up really going over time so um hopefully there's an opportunity for others to connect um submit some some info to cove and perhaps uh someone can make a connection as well if there's someone that you'd like to speak with or have some questions you want to direct them to i want to thank um everyone who's uh joined us today we really appreciate all of your comments and questions um and you taking the time to listen and thank you very much to frank and to ben and to mark for joining um and thanks to the team at cove for setting all of this up we really appreciate the behind the scenes um, we're going to continue this Mind the Gap conversation uh, again. And the next conversation we're going to have is on February 10th with Bruce Stover from Precise Design and Nathan Field from Ingenuity. And so we're going to talk about automation, AI, and robotics in the ocean tech industry. So we really hope that you're able to join us then as well. And thank you so much for your time today. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Enjoy it. Thanks very much. Cheers. Thanks, Jen. Well done.